Okay. Hello, everyone. T today, Seth and I are very pleased to bring with uh, to you today uh, an interview with a Wasabi contributor and researcher. So we are really happy to have nothing much on. Seth and I will be asking questions of him, but it's going to be pretty conversational. So it's not that he cannot ask us questions or things. Ultimately, the whole point of this conversation is to help the Monero and Wasabi communities intermingle a little bit because you've often been circling each other on many of the same ideals for quite a while at this point. So I think it's it's past due for us to have a conversation where we're actually chatting with each other. So thank you so much, Nothing Much, for coming on. Do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Um, hi. Uh, what's up? Uh, yeah, glad, glad to be here. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, interested in the in any sort of uh, like exchange of information or collaboration or anything with regards to privacy stuff. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, um, cool. Did you have anything else or, uh, Oh, like my background and stuff. I mean, that's you. Do you, would you like to talk about your background? Uh, I guess uh, I was previously quite active in the Perl community. Uh, kind of like grew up on open source, uh, learned to program from, uh, random people on the internet. And then, um, I had a bit of a, uh, like a crisis with, uh, software and Bitcoin, uh, so I kind of rage quit in 2010 and then Bitcoin kind of convinced me that software still has, uh, uh, you know, something good to do to the world, I guess. And, uh, you, yeah, I, I don't know what, like, um, it's just, uh, I guess an important project that, that, um, has, has changed my outlook on, uh, stuff, but, uh, as we all know, it has, uh, some serious, uh, privacy, uh, deficiencies. So, uh, yeah, here I am, uh, uh, after, uh, reading a lot and, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's awesome. It's good to Sorry. hear that you were able to finally find something that didn't drive you insane there. Uh, when you got involved in, in cryptocurrencies, were you always interested in privacy to begin with? Did, is this something that like a, a, a view you took into cryptocurrency or was it something you built up over time where you saw, you know, transparency mostly in the cryptocurrency community and then thought about privacy or did you sort of see this as a problem initially. I guess, so I've always had this kind of like overly trusting, but still like very aware notion of, of privacy. Like I distinctly remember in around 2004 must have been, like I first learned about like Ajax requests and I'm like, my takeaway was like, oh, so, so every single on mouse over event is potentially submitting data to the website. Uh, now I know, and I just changed my behavior online. And then like, uh, I think three years ago or two years ago, like everyone on the internet kind of lost their shit over those like session recording stuff. And I'm, I'm like, okay, but you, like, that's been possible since forever. Like, <laughs> why are we now freaking out? Um, and then, um, in. So like I said previously, I, I took like, I think uh, five or six years off of uh, like uh, away from, from the, the like software industry. And uh, during this time, the Snowden revelations had happened and I kind of became, uh, I guess, more aware of uh, like some aspects of politics and surveillance capitalism and stuff like that. And um, so it, like, I always cared about privacy. Um, I was always interested in cryptography, uh, but um, like it, it did not seem as relevant and as important. Um, and uh, kind of like coming back into to Bitcoin uh, or coming back into software due to Bitcoin um, was uh, like definitely had to do with uh, my, my ideology. So, um, uh, it took a long while to like get to a level where I was uh, comfortable um, in my knowledge to actually speak out and and try and, and change things. But um, it, it was like from from the start, I'd been uh, uh, motivated. Yeah, I'm curious since you kind of came into the space with privacy at top of mind. Um, how have you seen 
privacy, especially in Bitcoin, or just in the ecosystem as a whole, progress since you got back into software and got back into it because of Bitcoin? Have you seen kind of a good progression there? Have you seen it just recently become more of a an important issue? Or kind of how have you seen that change in the, the years you've been involved in Bitcoin and the ecosystem as a whole? Um, so I think it was like late 2015 when I had like my first um, serious exposure to Bitcoin. Prior to that, I'd heard about it several times before and kind of dismissed it because I thought I already understood. Um, like I had, uh, um, I had an interest in some of that stuff. Like I was aware of the double spend problem um, before I actually ran Hashcash on my like mail server and stuff. So I thought I knew everything. And then I, I saw Bitcoin when, I think when it was slash dotted and I thought, oh boy, this is stupid. And um, it, it took me a, a while to appreciate uh, like why it actually isn't. Uh, and then, uh, so I guess the first two years were like frantic, uh, like studying of everything and, you know, trying to make uh, sense of, um, of the space as a whole as well. Um, and this was a pretty exciting time from a privacy point of view because uh, like uh, Zcash was, you know, just uh, uh, starting to, um, I think it was, announced but maybe not released yet and um i was you know um just had a lot more information to kind of digest than i initially expected um so like part of that was um in hindsight and part of that was was like looking forward and it's it's a little bit difficult to like disentangle everything that i'd learned about after the fact even though it happened while i was already interested um uh and and i've been kind of like more and more focused specifically on bitcoin stuff um not so much for technical reasons but because of um i guess the the politics side of it or um like the economic side of it uh where it, it just seemed like you know it's it's happening people are using it and people don't really realize just how um hard it is to use privately uh, so even though there's like objectively better technology, um, it's um, kind of been like where I I had focused most of my attention because, um, you know, it just seems like where it's the most lacking. Um, and yeah, there, um, I guess it always seemed like it's a, a slower progression than I would have liked. Um, it's, it's a lot of it is just getting people to like even care in the first place. But like when you, you are already in like this niche, uh, I guess a lot of interesting stuff is happening. Um, and recently the paces seem to be like picking up as well. So I think there's a lot, so, there's certainly a lot of topics to cover I, there. I so really, we, like, we, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, there, I think there's a lot of different things we can go into uh, based off your responses there. But I think first, it per, would, I think, be good to have uh, an idea of what your vision for what you think Bitcoin would look like if, if you're able to continue iterating down these routes. What, what, did, what do you hope? Uh, you know, Bitcoin will look like if if a lot of these you know, privacy pushes that you support will be included or used. <laughs> yeah. So, like, super long term, I'm I'm skeptical that we're going to see like any radical change to the protocol, uh, which is kind of why I care about that specifically. I think like Bitcoin has had the the biggest impact, but uh, it's it's also like. Uh, from the its inception, it's had these like limitations and and changing things on a fundamental level, like adding confidential transactions or uh, n n new cryptographic assumptions or something like that for like zero knowledge proofs, is extremely controversial. Um, so, looking at it from a sort of more pragmatic, conservative point of view, uh, like my best hope is that um, we're able to have um, like various soft forks that do enable um like more uh efficient uh solutions but that most of the 
like the system as it's designed from my point of view seems like a like it's a settlement network and uh, not only that like i think in the long run lightning is going to be a settlement network um i think for the foreseeable future it's definitely still like useful for for payments if you can you know if people will actually accept um but i i kind of envision that like uh the various solutions that already exist um like uh, coin join um or have been discussed like uh coin swap and uh potentially other solutions like uh blind state chains or stuff like that um will eventually like take most of the like the privacy considerations um off chain basically um so i i don't expect many radical changes in the protocol itself but um i do hope that like um, in, in my best case scenario, since the incentives for uh, privacy and scalability are aligned, um, when you consider like th the less information you put on the blockchain, the better your privacy is. Um, uh, I, I do hope that like people like normal people will will start to care more and start to use this software more. Um, and and yeah, like that that we'll see these like non-ideal uh right they're theoretically they're they fall way short of um uh solutions like uh what zcash has or what monero has uh but I, I think it can be like uh good enough to resist at least uh like dragnet surveillance uh if not targeted surveillance as well um and yeah it's mostly a user adoption issue like that would be the limiting constraint more than anything else um uh, did or sorry i i'm kind of rambling there but like did you intend to ask specifically about like the wabi sabi stuff yeah i think what I, I, if it's okay i'd like to get to wabi sabi a second here i just wanted to set the scope in terms of what you thought in general about uh bitcoin's privacy ecosystem in a way right like what uh what because you know wabi sabi will be built of course on bitcoin right so it'll be a tool that you can use in conjunction with bitcoin so i wanted to hear more about what your thoughts were uh with you know with regard to what that whole picture looks like i guess and so i was starting broader um okay. do you think that i mean so i guess from my perspective i I just, the number of limitations with really any sort of second layer or any sort of additional privacy feature, regardless of really what it is, right? We can talk about CoinJoin as the example, right? But ultimately, if you use a second layer network for you know, everyday settlements, and if you use the broad you know, Bitcoin network for only occasional settlement, let's say, if, if we do get to that point, well, how are you reasonably going to still try and protect your privacy if at the end of the day the amounts are visible like it uh if, if at the bare minimum you don't have ct or i like to call it usually confidential amounts because ct is kind of misleading in, in its name but if you don't even hide the amounts on the base layer how can you really architect good additional solutions on top because it, you're always going to be leaking this enormous piece of metadata no matter what you do and then you kind of have to work around that in a really weird way yeah i guess that's the main challenge that we're kind of uh trying to to work with right now in the context of coin joints so like wabi sabi is just a, a like a building block um and you can use it in ways that are completely broken uh and it's precisely so it's not just the uh, amounts that leak a horrible amount of metadata. It's also the overt graph structure, uh, which has like no, um, um, like there, the, you you always know for sure that the antecessor inputs to some transaction have been spent in that transaction. So necessarily, uh, any entity that controlled that output. Uh, being spent uh, must have agreed to participate in this transaction. So it also removes that like layer of uh, plausible deniability. Um, that said, you know, I I don't foresee that 
the majority of people will realize uh, and switch. And I think even if they did, uh, switching to a different cryptocurrency is, um, I mean, there are other factors apart from privacy that, uh, like the Lindy effect, uh, shelling points, etc. cetera. Um, so I'm somewhat um, like, pessimistic about these stuff like these problems being resolved on like the base layer as it were um but i do think that it's possible to like address that um so specifically um coin joins kind of address the the graph side of things um and if they are equal amount coin joins they handle um like obscuring the um like the, the 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 leaks within the amount information are are reduced as far as as they could be uh into like just a uh, you you have some sort of like lower bound on the uh holdings of of participants um but i think you can go a lot further by um um using uh like standard amounts in order to um like just create uh, sufficient arithmetic relations um, that that really is as far as as you leak. Like that, there there's no more uh, deterministic um, uh, linking between inputs and outputs based on their amounts. Um, and even though that is you know not as robust uh, from a privacy perspective, uh, uh, there's also the you know the um, opposite angle of you know. Um, uh, Bitcoiners caring more about uh, inflation resistance and, and stuff like that, um, which even if you don't agree with, uh, many people do think that way and therefore will not switch. Um, and and there's the, the also the, the fact that it's just more widely deployed and um, like more people accept it, more people use it. Um, so... I think it's not going away, and I think we have to do something to improve the situation, even if it's not perfect. Um, uh, like Bitcoin really needs, like any money really needs fungibility to work. And I think um, like having good enough fungibility from the point of view of like, um, it's not priced differently. Like merchants don't have an impetus to like censor transactions on behalf of governments and so on and so forth. Um, like cash is not actually fungible because it has serial numbers, but like in practice, it mostly is. If we can get to that situation, I think we'd be in a far better place. Um, and it's, you know, I, I don't, I don't consider myself a maximalist either. Like, I, I don't think it's a, a zero sum game, um, even though there probably will only be like a single money. Uh, I think there's room for many currencies. Um, and it's important to me like that, that privacy is at least good enough. Um, um, so that that's kind of, you know, the, the angle from, from which I'm uh, seeing it. Okay. Yeah, I, I want to go in on the fungibility part because I, so I work for a I work for a cryptocurrency company that trades on many different exchanges and I do compliance and I've used many different blockchain analysis software before and in every single one of these using an optional privacy tool or even using an optional on network privacy feature now in the case of like Dash and Zcash, exchanges, any service that has to register with like any, you know, any major country that you would expect, they all try to identify transactions that come from or are related to mixing, right? Because they want to try and find the higher risk transactions. And so getting back to the whole fungibility component, right? I'm personally concerned that what we're seeing now will continue where if someone uses a tool like Wasabi, exchanges will get a flag to say, hey, this user deposited funds from Wasabi and they'll be marked as higher risk. And then the user will have to fill out a questionnaire, which is really annoying about why they used a mixing service. So. To what extent, in your opinion, do you think that it actually, that 
uh, this solution actually assists fungibility, do you, do you actually see these solutions as ad adequately addressing the fungibility issue? Or how do you view fungibility, I assume? Because I think we look at it very different ways. I guess it's a double-edged sword, right? If it remains a, a niche issue, um, then yes, people using coin joins will, given that coin joins are overt, uh, will flag themselves. Um, that may be good or it may be bad for fungibility. If it gets normalized, if enough people... Um, like the first adopters, as it were, kind of pay this personal cost, as unfortunate as it is, and get exchanges to realize like, hey, maybe this heuristic uh, for, you know, risk is actually, um, you know, not as reliable as we thought. Because um, it's not, as far as I understand, any sort of legal requirement. I mean, compliance could be achieved by um, other means, it's just a way of like uh, doing cost cutting and and ensuring you don't like. So so if they're losing business from legitimate users who are using this kind of technology, um, and or or forcing them to go through a, a process uh, that incurs a cost to them and and um, uh, like if it happens enough at some point, like maybe uh, things will be. Um, like the new status quo would just be like coin joins are fine because uh, you can always prove the like the origins of coins if like you really need to um, to do that. Um, that's kind of like my best case scenario uh, for the worst case scenario where, you know, this is just going to, to keep happening. Right. The. Um, uh, transaction surveillance companies business model is basically um, predicated on the notion that it's um, it's a good predictor of criminality, like when somebody wants privacy, uh, and and that very assumption, like um, sort of like rules out fungibility almost by definition. So um, for that, we need like covert. Uh, techniques as well. So, like, it's not just coin joins. Coin joins are just one way of of achieving some level of privacy, uh, but losing out in other ways. Um, so, if uh, so, blind state chains are are another potential solution for, um, like, if you can uh, exchange those atomically off chain, uh, you get effectively the same thing. Uh, CoinSwap gives you the ability to, um, especially now with like uh, multi-party ECDSA stuff, um, the fingerprint ability is down. So it gives you a way of doing uh, swaps that are uh, disjoint on the transaction graph and therefore um, uh, like break a lot of those uh, assumptions. There's also uh, pay joins, which are um, uh, break many of the heuristics that go into like the most naive uh, graph analysis. Uh, and also some ideas that haven't really, um, so uh, I recently rediscovered a, a paper called uh, Coin Party, I think, which uh, is already from 2015 and also proposes like using uh, multi-party ECDSA. There's some issues with uh, trust there, but the, the transaction structure that they describe is actually very compelling, I think, for um, from a privacy point of view uh, and from a fungibility point of view. It's not a double-edged sword like uh, coin join. So I think like my, my ideal future scenario is basically where um, everybody just agrees that we need, you know, some better privacy like at the base layer i don't see that that will happen i think it's too contentious but um like i will settle for a critical mass of users um fighting for their own privacy and in this way uh like normalizing um the idea that uh, people deserve privacy and just because you have privacy uh, doesn't mean that like uh it's absolute, right? Like privacy is about choice. It's about uh, the ability to uh, opt out of surveillance and opt, you know, to to not engage with uh, like 
uh, entities that don't respect it. And um, it's about having, um, like being a, a rational agent in, in the world, right? Being able to, to think and like, if you're under the chilling effects of a panopticon, um, like, sure, nobody needs privacy anymore because nobody has it and nobody does anything that's considered controversial. Um, but that's not a world I really want to live in. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah I, have, I have a couple of quick questions that come out of that. Um, I definitely like I would love to see that the ideal world that you've talked about where enough people are using tools like CoinJoin or CoinSwap or PayJoin or all of these sorts of things that break those heuristics that are currently used. Um, and I think the place where I struggled to see that is just in both using the tools myself um, and just interacting with people. I know, I know Twitter's not a great gauge of a lot of things, but most of the people who are like deeply into cryptocurrency are on there. And those are the people that I'm interacting with pretty regularly. And it's interesting to see that even among the people who are deep in the cryptocurrency space, very few of them are able to competently use solutions like CoinJoin and actually preserve their privacy. And a lot of them don't even really know what that means. Um, and so this this idea of seeing mass adoption there is one that I like struggle to see as a realistic one. Um, so I'm curious to, to know if you have a, a path that you see as a way to get it to be something that's not just the niche, like very techno elite users who know that they want privacy gaining that because I'm all for that. And I know that those tools, they work right now in for most scenarios, they work well to preserve your privacy and I can opt into those, but I also am, I'm a technical user. I'm deeply in the cryptocurrency space and I don't want it to be something that's just for either the techno elite or the wealthy as far as fees are concerned with this type of thing. So I'm curious how you see that kind of the tipping point of adoption of CoinJoin and other privacy tools where it becomes common enough that at least enough people use it to make it break those heuristics or that most people use it. Because a lot of people don't even know they want privacy, but I want to be able to build tools that give them that privacy, whether or not they decide I want privacy today or not. Uh, and then one last, thing, one last thing before you address that, just one thing I want to tack on. At, uh, and then at what point do you sort of say, okay, adoption probably actually will not happen throwing a towel. At what point do you actually admit that? So I guess it's easier to start from the end, which is like, uh, I don't know, at some point, maybe I will just lose motivation and stop caring, right? Um, <laughs> it's really hard to predict. I think so long as it's technically possible, it's worth working on because um, like, most people have heard of, of Bitcoin and have not heard of like various privacy coins and exchanges like in particular seem to um, strongly prefer like avoiding them, right? Like the, the reason it seems that Zcash has been listed on exchanges, whereas Monero generally has not, is because um, Monero makes the privacy part um, mandatory, whereas uh, in Zcash it's opt-in and very few people opt-in. Um, so I don't know. Um, it's really hard for me to say like what I will feel uh, after, you know, a few more years of frustration. Um, so sorry that that's a cop-out answer, but that, that's the best that I've got. As for the other part, um, focusing on coin joints, uh, yes, they're fraught with peril. It's very easy to use them incorrectly. It's um, It requires an understanding of like the UTXO model of the notion of a transaction graph of uh, like combinatorics on amounts, uh, like how you can partition transactions to um, link things based on, on the amounts of, between both sides. Um, it requires an understanding of intersection attacks. Um, all these like nuances are, um, are it's not reasonable for uh, even advanced users to kind of uh, like, I, I don't know as far as, so I, I've been studying this stuff for, I think three years now, pretty intensely. Like I have other interests and projects and, um, but like within Bitcoin, this is like the thing that I care about. and. 
I can't tell you with any confidence that I can use this stuff with, without having a significant risk of, of uh, screwing it up. Um, but coin joins are not done either. Uh, and this is exactly like, so, so um, in, in trying to, to um, I guess, give some suggestions for how uh, specifically Wasabi's coin joins could have been improved like two years ago, um, like my conversations with uh, Adam uh, Nopara uh, started and um, and now I'm at a point where I'm I'm confident that uh, it is possible to to use coin joins in a way that is um, is going to be fairly simple for for users um, and um, Wabi Sabi has definitely been designed as like a building block uh, with that specific goal in mind. Uh, like the first thing that I had is a, a transaction structure um, and uh, it was not practical. It was too costly. It was too inefficient. Achieving it with blind signatures were, was not um, really viable, but it was, it still felt like a good direction to pursue. And then when we started this project, the first agenda was um, to uh, work out like, okay, how, how are we going to actually coordinate coin joins so that we can realize something like that without like having uh, discussed those parts in detail yet. Uh, and we agreed that the like finding a general mechanism was uh, like the first order of business. Um, and I think we have one that is fairly simple. So like now is the time to apply it. Um, and I think that's actually where the interesting stuff is. Uh, also, I've been uh, like, um, so incidentally, I decided to do like a, a blog post series to kind of explain like this transaction structure in a way that would be more accessible. Uh, and I, I really struggle with writing. So it's been like taking forever. Uh, and it, it was like a five part series and then it became a six part series. Uh, so uh, the the sixth part was like me realizing like maybe the best way to convey this idea is to just do like a mock-up of a user interface um, and kind of show, you know, what, what would using a coin join wallet that uh, has these capabilities, what might it, feel like for uh, a user and like can, can it be as intuitive as like those terrible for privacy wallets that just give you a balance and completely hide and abstract away the notion of like unspent transaction outputs or coin control um and this actually turned out to be perhaps the most interesting rabbit hole um in that like uh um uh, uh um, effort to to kind of explicate what I would like there to be. Uh, I got in touch with uh, John Spahari, I think is his last name, um, on the Bitcoin Design Slack. He recently um, uh, won a grant from uh, Square Crypto. He's been um, looking at um, uh, mainly usability, uh, especially in like developing economies, uh, like uh, studying how users um, use like mobile monies, like M-Pesa, uh, and uh, trying to figure out like how how to accommodate the needs of uh, those users, and he so I, I just asked on the Slack channel um, like whether or not somebody is willing to help me kind of think through um, the Wabi Subby stuff, uh, and he reached out, and we've been uh, having some like very fruitful conversations, um, and and at this point I'm I'm convinced that it's possible, like maybe we won't be able to do it. We as in like Wasabi um, on the first try. Um, but I think users should be able to have um, wallets that um, give them an experience that's as convenient as like those balance oriented wallets um, that only incur uh, additional delays for the uh, coordination side of things. So like that, that just cannot be like, you need a, a solution that's not coin joins in order to not be dependent on the desires of other users, right? Do other users want to have privacy with me right now? That That's always going to be the limiting constraint for, uh, for this kind of thing. But I think uh, assuming that that's not really a barrier, 
uh, perhaps due to sufficient adoption or you know just better implementations or um, I think it would be possible to to give uh, a a very simplified user experience that still kind of steers you in the direction of of um, developing awareness for the nuances um, and that the the like the main sources of of um, um, misuse or user errors are uh, can be eliminated. Um, I, I, I guess like we can go into more details about like specifically what transaction structure I have in mind, but um, I, I think that mostly answers it uh, for now, right? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's exciting because I think that is a a huge key to seeing usage increase is just the ability to abstract away especially in something that has to be interactive, like coin joins, abstract away the whole coin join process, have it happen in the background so users don't have to worry about, like, I want to be in this round or I need to mix these inputs, that kind of thing. Um, that and then catching a lot of nuance and handling like coin control for users. And th there's a lot of stuff that has to happen, but um, that is exciting to hear that you at least see a, a path forward. Um, and hopefully Wabi Sabi is a good step forward in that. Um, yeah. So I guess, so, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, I, I, what I was going to suggest is, um, like maybe explaining a little bit, like how we came up with the Wabi Sabi building blocks as we did and, um, uh, independently, like in either order, uh, also like the, I guess the state of, um, uh, coin joins and like what work we built on uh, or are hoping to build on uh, for the transaction structure. Um, yeah, I agree. I guess. We'll start with the first one. <laughs> so that was literally like um, we tried to come up with like the, the most generic possible like solution, like something that can um, like actually prior to that, uh, Adam started this um, like Wasabi research club or journal club thingy, which was uh, like YouTube streamed like sessions. Some of them are not streamed, but uh, they still happen uh, fairly regularly. Uh, more recently, they've been more casual. Um, so I, I guess we can like add a link or something. Um, uh, but uh, th those are those happen in the open, uh, like anybody can join. And uh, I think it started like in the beginning of the year. Um, and and the idea was like every week there would be a, a, like a paper. Uh, so um, stuff about um, um, like Bitcoin privacy. Uh, we covered like a coin shuffle and the like the knapsack uh, mixing paper, which I'm, I'm going to get into. Um, and uh, network level stuff. Uh, there was a, like an excellent session with um, uh, people from the um, NIM project. Um, so that that was kind of like a a, a long brainstorming uh, like period. And um, following that, like um, th there was basically a, a kind of a good idea of of where um, Wasabi could be improved. Um, then we started to work, um, uh, like specifically on finding, um, like a, a technical solution to the coordination problem. Uh, so in Wasabi right now, uh, it, it's pretty ad hoc. It uses, uh, Chamin, uh, blind signatures. Actually, uh, it's Schnorr blind signatures. It used to be Chamin blind signatures, but, um, uh, they kind of work the same in the sense that. Um, they are publicly verifiable, which is not really needed, but doesn't hurt. Um, and then they only convey a single bit of information from the signer to the verifier, which in this case is the same entity. It's the coordinator. So when you present um, a bunch of inputs together, unfortunately, um, you you can say like look I have you know uh, this amount of Bitcoin plus that amount of Bitcoin I would like to mix them uh, 
I know that the standard denomination right now is like 0 0.1 plus some epsilon or plus minus some epsilon. Um, the coordinator verifies that those outputs exist. Uh, it verifies that you actually own them. So you need to prove that you're able to spend them. Um, and it uh, checks that your requested change amount, which is also directly linked to these, um, plus the standard denominations that you asked for, like really do add up to what you have. And if that's the case, then it takes note of all of this data and it gives you a blind signature or uh, perhaps several uh, if you use the denomination multipliers. So um, like uh, very quickly, like the, the usually Wasabi uh, coin joints start with a base denomination of around 0 0.1 Bitcoin. Um, if you bring in a large amount, then like you can, you always need to do like the, the, the lowest one, but you can also um, register like 0 0.2. And if you still have more left, you can add a 0 0.4 and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's kind of an inefficient way of breaking down an amount because it's not exactly the binary representation, uh, but it, it kind of lets you um, go through the whole process a little bit quicker. Um, and um, so the reason it's all, all structured in this like very uh, crude way that uh, still reveals a lot of information to the coordinator and eventually to the world, although perhaps not as much, it's generally most of that information is recoverable from the coin join structure. Uh, like it's pretty easy to, um, a partition a transaction and and uh, associate specific change outputs with specific combinations of inputs, uh, even though things are shuffled. So uh, this limitation arises from the fact that blind signatures can only convey a single bit of information, uh, and that bit of information is like the holder of the signature. Uh, did indeed register with valid inputs in this round and is entitled to this amount, and that's it. Um, so you reveal the blind signature uh, later in order to register an output. And uh, due to the unlinkability of blind signatures, uh, all the coordinator knows is like that the, the, it, it learns the output address at that point. It already knew the amount. Uh, and all it learns is like this output address really does uh, represent the interests of a user that uh, previously received a blind signature. Um, so that's, that's a very limiting mech with, um, it, um, it creates issues like, uh, so you need to link everything together. There's a, for denial of service reasons and civil protection reasons, uh, there's a minimum denomination requirement, which is, uh, fairly high. I mean, um, uh, I don't know about you, but like a thousand dollars is like not a casual spending amount for me. Um, it's a, uh, in, like, you know, it's, uh, bigger than the per capita, uh, like, um, uh, GDP, I think of some countries like in Africa. So like, if we're serious about like cryptocurrency, like helping the world, but we're only like serving relatively wealthy uh, people who, I mean, already live in in places where where they have to f the freedom to to do this. Like, who exactly are we helping? Um, I mean, uh, that's hyperbolic, but like, I th I think my my point was uh, uh, was 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 clear. Like, it, it's it's too restrictive for like mass adoption and for for helping the, the, the people who, who really need this stuff. Um, and it's, uh, it requires everybody to agree in advance on the base denomination, which actually in Wasabi's case is not even a standard one. It varies over time because of the requirement to cover the fees. So because you need to uh, combine the amounts that will cover the fees with the amounts that will cover the uh, outputs of your your mix, um, you 
like you you can't really remix if it's always the same thing like if it was constant then like you would constantly needing to be bringing in an additional input to um to cover that cost and thereby undoing the benefit of the previous round so uh like at that point uh, that there's no um like real benefit to remixing. So that, that's why it, it varies over time uh, and, and decreases. Um, so all these complications like um, were a real challenge for like doing anything uh, better than what Wasabi already does, which is like uh, those like slightly weird, like equal amount coin joins. Um, so we reviewed, um, a bunch of different like uh, blind signature schemes. Uh, we looked at um, maybe using uh, Ring CT as well. Actually, there's a, a new system used by. Uh, actually, I don't think it's deployed yet uh, for uh, Zcoin called Lelantis, which uh, is actually very similar to Ring CT. It like changes the um, ring signatures uh, and does the uh, confidential amounts in a way that's. Uh, um i think identical like it still uses uh Patterson commitments um there is uh like we also looked at zcash stuff um and eventually we narrowed down on anonymous credentials as like a building block um and specifically key verifiable anonymous credentials which are somewhat more efficient um uh because they're not private uh, publicly verifiable uh, so, like, only the issuer of credentials can verify uh, that a credential is valid uh, by having access to uh, a secret key. Um, and, like, really in brief, what anonymous credentials are, I, I guess it's a generalization of blind signatures where the signer can, can authorize a, a piece of information, just like a signature does. Um, but uh, this is... And this is in response to kind of an overt action. So like it, it, the holder of an input that's known publicly in this case gets uh, gets a credential. Uh, but the credentials also have attributes. Uh, so like more structured information that at the time of issuance, um, there has some idea unlike blind signatures where there's like no information whatsoever. Uh, and uh, there's also the, um, like you, you can present credentials. Um, we don't actually use this, but like in the, the literature, uh, it's normal that you need, uh, like uh, there's a property called unlinkable multi-show, um, which uh, lets you, uh, present a credential multiple times in a way that's not like the individual uh, presentations are not linkable to each other. Um, and you can also be selective about which attributes you reveal or what information you reveal about them. So the the credential scheme that we went with is actually quite new. Uh, it's uh, due to Melissa Chase, uh, Trevor Perrin, and Greg Zavarucha, uh, who um, are it was developed for the uh, signal uh, group messaging like administration stuff where like they need to authenticate users and they need to handle like administrator rights and like group membership updates and stuff like that uh, in a way that is uh, more privacy protecting. So uh, they extended a previous scheme uh, uh, developed by Melissa Chase, uh, Sarah Michael John and Grab Sarah for uh, keyed verification anonymous credentials. Um, and uh, that in turn is based on uh, algebraic max, which is just like an HMAC, except it uses like elliptic curves as the primitive instead of, uh, or any group really, uh, instead of a hash function. So um, the the scheme allows us to um, basically sign off on homomorphic amount commitments. Um, so in, in this regard, it's very similar to confidential transactions or confidential amounts, as you said, is, is actually much more appropriate here. So the users um, now can display an input, just a single input at a time. And 
um, the coordinator would learn the uh, amount that they are entitled to by owning this input should they choose to spend it in a coin join transaction and can issue credentials with uh, each credential has a single uh, amount uh, commitment as an attribute. Uh, and the only thing that the, the coordinator learns is that the sum of the requested credentials for a specific input uh, equals to the like its balance with respect to the input amount. So you can think of it kind of as like going uh, like you 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 put your money into a pool, uh, except this is not actually moving anything, right? This is uh, uh, and 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 then it's like a a, a centralized side chain or something that's like uh, gets constructed and torn down instantaneously um, by the the last signature. So the 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 last user to sign the coin join kind of makes this side chain like actually come into existence and immediately disappear because it's atomically spent in the same transaction. Um, but the off chain coordination that happens before allows uh, the structure of this transaction to be um, uh, right. Like users can can combine their amounts. Uh, using these credentials they can split their amounts they can like uh take multiple coins and break them up into different amounts and 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 create like equal amount mixed outputs or they can uh use them to uh set up uh payments or uh they can transfer them to each other so like you can also do uh a value transfers in the space of a coin join um and um yeah, so all, all of this is based on uh, a few bu basic building blocks, so something analogous to blind signatures, uh, homomorphic amount commitments, and uh, range proofs. Um, and I, I hope I didn't overcomplicate it, or uh, but like it, it should be, um, yeah, it should be obvious that like using this building block, you can basically create any sort of transaction structure that you want, even one that's not necessarily uh, like. So, for example, uh, a shared coin uh, had no uh, restrictions whatsoever on the actions that user the users uh, can can uh, add to a, uh, a coin join transaction, uh, which led to many users uh, being uh, de-anonymizable by correlating their amounts. So you can do that with Wabi Sabi, like there's nothing preventing you. Uh, that would be like the the next uh, uh, step. Um, was so, that clear? Like, Yeah, really quick question out of that. So kind of like a summary would be that Wabi Sabi is building side chains that you can spin up and down to hide amounts. Uh, so, to allow sorry, sidechain was. Yeah, it's uh, side was just, just an analogy. My, yeah. My bad. Um, yeah. No, I know it's not actually a sidechain, but it's it's basically giving you a channel to provide the information that's necessary to the coordinator, without revealing anything about who you are or even how much you're putting in. Just that you own the amount that you're yes, putting in, exactly. and that it, things balance out. So you essentially are reducing the visibility that the coordinator has. And in doing that, you allow more things to be done in each mix cycle because you can like pass the credential to someone else. You could do a coin swap esque transaction in the mix, kind of too, by passing them off, or I guess a coin party or whatever the new term for that is. Um, so I would not call that coin swap because those are not compared to coin swap because uh, coin swaps are disjoint on the transaction graph, whereas here a value transfer happens in the space of a single transaction. Uh, this would be much more like pay joins, uh, although in the typical like usage of that term, uh, pay joins are uh, steganographic, like they're designed to look like normal payments, whereas these would still look like coin joins. Uh, but the idea is, uh, yeah, like uh, suppose I want to send you like, uh, uh, I don't know, 0.5 Bitcoin and I have 0.7. And uh, so I register my 0.7. I request two credentials, one for 0.5 and one for my change, 0.2. And um, I uh, give the credential for 0.5 to you. And then you can choose to register an input as well and, and use both the credential that you got from me and the credential that you uh, yourself requested. 
uh, and register an output amount. Uh, you could further split it. Um, so um, yeah, it's 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 very much like um, uh, you you can do like arbitrary um, reallocations of of the amounts off chain, and and the coordinator does not learn anything except that um, every registration operation is balanced. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, when you issue credentials uh, in an input registration, the you can also present credentials, uh, but the requested credential amount minus the presented credential amount uh, minus uh, um, has to equal the input amount, which is overt, minus the fees. Uh, and the same goes for output registration just with a sign inversion. So, uh, um, and, and individual credentials are not linkable to their issuing request or to each other. Yeah, I, I, that's definitely pretty fascinating. And even breaks the heuristic of an input in the coin join being owned by someone necessarily on, this, on the output or being owned by the same person as someone on the input, because you can essentially do pay join type transfers in the mix, which is interesting. Yeah, I think that's perhaps um, the one of the most exciting things for me. Uh, it's that um, it potentially like really calls into question some of these like uh, uh, sketchy heuristics uh, and and assumptions. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you still need to have some sort of side channel to share those credentials, I would assume. That's not going to be natively within Wasabi or Wabi Sabi, but you could do that via some other side channel, like over Tor or a messaging board or something like that. Yeah, uh, what I'm imagining right now, and this is like very premature, but like uh, BIP78 is the latest like pay join uh, proposal, um, and it uh, standardizes um, like a um a bip21 uri parameter uh, i think it's pj uh which contains uh, like a tor endpoint uh and then like as a receiver you generate a bip21 url that says like if you'd rather pay as a pain joy and connect to this tor address to this like hidden service um and it, i think it's ephemeral i think it's per payment but i may be wrong about that uh, and then on the um, sender side, uh, if you don't know what that is, you just use the normal BIP21 URI. Uh, so you use the address and the amount. And if you do know, then you can connect to that endpoint and negotiate uh, a pay join transaction instead. So this would probably work almost exactly the same in terms of the user experience. It's just that the endpoint says, uh, like, do you support Wabi Sabi? Uh, let's connect to this coordinator, um, and uh, instead of giving you like a uh, transaction and then negotiating a new transaction with your additional inputs, uh, I'll just give you a credential, and at the end, I'll ask you whether or not I should sign the transaction. Okay, I I, I think I'm following so far. Um, I've been. You know, obviously, I haven't been following with Wabi Sabi super, super closely uh, yet, but I will. I, I notice on the GitHub you have a like a beginner Wabi Sabi by analogy thing. Um, I think that'd be a good place for users to start with. Um, Seth is certainly more uh, capable and competent in terms of um, the specifics on, on Wabi Sabi. I would say if there if there's one major hurdle that you think, or I guess. What, what I guess are, are Wabi Sabi's most major challenges for implementation, if it's just like one or two of the most difficult things? I guess efficiency of, like, we need range proofs. Uh, so that's like tricky crypto. And Wasabi is written in C Sharp. So, like, right now we're doing a, a, a proof of concept of the crypto stuff, which is uh, using or going to be using, it's not yet ready. Um, like just very basic, uh, like Sigma protocols uh, for the zero knowledge proof. So it's going to be at least in the first um, like iteration, uh, like several kilobytes per request, uh, most likely, but hopefully we can bring that down in order to reduce the um, 
uh, like the the network layer uh, leak, like uh, making the traffic analysis uh, more difficult. Um, I think like bulletproofs make sense to me. Uh, it's not one hundred percent clear to me if that's actually going to be uh, implemented or if like the Wasabi team is going to call like something uh, a little less efficient uh, good enough. Um, Have you heard of bulletproof but, plus? Uh, yeah, uh, I don't remember. I looked at the paper and I don't remember the exact um, like trick that they use but it's it's a very uh like i i think it's it's still conceptually the same thing of like a a, a sort of like recursive inner product argument if, if i'm not mistaken so uh it should be completely interchangeable yeah it does have a size um improvement over regular bulletproofs even though verification time i believe is the same so that could be could be helpful even if you're going to implement bulletproofs but i mean since you're not publishing this info on chain you're not as constricted with size and verification time especially since they're not even being publicly verified so yeah you, you can go with something I mean, this is simpler because you don't have the same size and verification time constraints as a layer one solution so the the size issue is a consideration uh verification not so much uh, like the the O N overhead of uh, or sorry the O N uh, like verification improving costs with bulletproofs is uh, not an issue at all. I would I would say uh, the uh, size is potentially an issue because all of this is happening over like ephemeral Tor circuits. Like every action that you do uh, against the coordinator has to happen on a different Tor circuit, and um, I mean a few tens of kilobytes is not a big deal for Tor circuits, but like um, the larger the coin joins, since everybody has to succeed, uh, like the more users that you have over more circuits transferring more data, the higher the probability that one user is going to have some sort of uh, hiccup. Uh, and if that user is not able to sign, then everybody kind of is screwed at that point. Like everybody has to start over. Um, because otherwise the coin join transaction would not be valid. So this is mainly a user experience consideration. Uh, it's also to a lesser extent, I think a traffic analysis thing. So like if you consider a passive global adversary, uh, you probably don't want to reveal to uh, such an adversary that you're even doing coin joins with a specific coordinator. Um, and the, the more, and, and the, the, the actions are fairly synchronous. So like when it's time to do uh, output registration, everybody does it as at the same time. So, um, there's a, uh, uh, from a traffic analysis point of view, uh, there's still a concern with larger range proofs uh, for now. We're not worrying about that. Like the first thing we want to do is make sure that the credential scheme works. And for that, we just have to know that the, uh, amount commitments in, in the attributes are uh, positive values uh, within a, a, uh, an allowed range. Um, by the way, like I already went into way more detail than that, like by analogy exp explainer thingy. So yeah, yeah, um, do, yeah. Uh, do you wanna like go into that quickly or was that like a remark for your own sake? I it was for my own sake, so, or, or any, viewer that is uh, watching now and hearing a Wabi Sabi for the first time, perhaps it best to be start reviewing that and then come back to the video. Is that, would you agree with that? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I think I may have kind of uh, like jumped to conclusions with respect to the target audience. Like, uh, well, as even so, it's, it's, it's important to have this documented somewhere where people can digest it. It's important for people to have different ways of doing that. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I mean, here, like, uh, I, I, I just, um, because of like Monero and confidential transactions, I think I may have, uh, like jumped the gun into like going into the, the weeds of this stuff. Um, so my, my bad, uh, the, the explainer <laughs> is written with, with no cryptographic background requirements, uh, almost. Cool. So I, I, I'm trying to remember you, you, you talked originally, um, we had the split where you had uh, the two major topics you still wanted to cover. The first one being the the the, the uh, 
I believe, inspiration and background behind wasabi, uh, sorry, wabi sabi for the second part. Do we also cover your second uh, topic you wanted to discuss? So that would be how to apply this. Uh, and uh, there, there's a, a lovely paper. Um, I always forget the name because I just call it knapsack uh, because that's the approach that they they uh, offered. But basically, they analyzed the limitations of equal amount coin joins and um, of naive uh, variable amount coin joins uh, with a um, uh, a pretty nice like theoretical model as well, um, uh, based on like analyzing partitions. Um, and what they propose is, um, like in in brief, um, let's say I have a transaction that I would like to do, and you have a transaction that you would like to do. Um, we can just concatenate those two transactions into a coin join. Uh, However, uh, in all likelihood, unless we coordinate our amounts um, to begin with, uh, it would be fairly self-evident that these are two distinct transactions that have been concatenated into a single one. So, um, what, th like the the they have uh, three algorithms in in the paper, or sorry, two algorithms and one is is mentioned, but um, they implemented uh, simulations of all three. Uh, where you basically take the output amounts. Um, and so if you have like the larger of the two, you split it into the uh, output amount of the other transaction so that the, the transaction with the larger amount has uh, two outputs and one of them is equivalent. Um, then like in this way, you... Uh, introduce ambiguity. Like even if somebody is able to solve um, all partitions of a transaction and, and enumerate that space of possibilities, uh, they would not like by construction. You guarantee that there's at least several solutions, and uh, that ambiguity is what kind of uh, recovers the uh, familiar notion of privacy that equal amount coin joins have, uh, is, where is equal amount. Yeah, I was going to say, is that similar to Stonewall or Stonewall X2 that Samurai implements? I know they do something similar with how they introduce ambiguity into unequal amount transactions, but I could be way off. Just curious. Uh, so Stonewall is a uh, simulated coin joins. So those, um, like, I think it, it looks much more like join market transactions uh, when you do that. Um, Join market is actually a, um, so in join market, you can think of the taker as the coordinator, right? Like I, as a user would like to do a coin join. Therefore I get unilateral control over the transaction structure. All I need is to convince other users to, uh, bring in their inputs, uh, and eventually sign, which I do by paying them fees. Um, so this gives like complete control for the uh, taker over like the the output amounts. Um, so I think it still looks like an equal amount coin join when you use Stonewall. Um, I'm I'm not like it may be more flexible than that, but that's as far as I know. And then uh, Stonewall two X is uh, a different beast because that's their uh, pay join uh, support. Um, I would imagine that that's that necessarily has a different transaction structure because I think it transfer value transfers value between the two users. Um, but I, I'm, uh, I'm drawing a blank on the details. So, um, yeah, sorry, sorry. to distract. Uh, Just trying to connect the dots between all the different coin join things. No, it's, it's good. It's, uh, um, yeah, I, I have a tendency to ramble, so it's, it's very good to, to get pushback, um, keeping me grounded. Um, yeah, so, um, in the knapsack stuff, it's more that like, we already have, like, let's say I want to send some money to some other user or maybe to myself or something. Um, and we're still kind of all coming together, um, in a way that's, um, n none of us is, uh, like a passive participant. Like we all are takers in some sense. 
um, we can still construct a transaction that's maybe not exactly what we wanted to begin with, um, but achieves a similar effect. And um, uh, and we do that by introducing like a splitting of outputs. Uh, and we do that splitting so that there's um, uh, these arithmetic relationships. So like you can substitute like output A for output outputs B and C. Um, and, and, uh, or like if, if there's, uh, an output a in the original list, you split output a to, uh, a prime one and a prime two, and then output B and a prime two, for example, might be the exactly the same amount. So those would be interchangeable. Um, so, but by constructing the transactions in this way, uh, you have a lot of the flexibility of variable amounts. Uh, but um, an intuition for the privacy that's very similar to equal amount coin joins, um, where like there's there's a, a fundamental like amount of uh, ambiguity uh, that's always there. Uh, like there's always more than one way to interpret the transaction. Um, so my idea to kind of uh, like I. I was proposing like uh, already ages ago, like uh, I think two years ago, uh, using a preferred value series. So basically like cash. Uh, so like a one, two, five series where you have like one Satoshi, two, five, 10, 50, 20, uh, sorry, 10, 20, 50, et cetera, uh, or powers of two um, in order to like um, do something that's, um, uh, like a very different approach to this knapsack um, um, knapsack mixing where like, suppose you have a variable amount, like let's say you received uh, something with many digits in it because uh, of like, you know, maybe you priced things in dollars and the rate was, you know, so, so now you have like eight decimal places of, uh, uh, of metadata in your amount um, uh uh, probably way more than is needed for like any uh, economic reason, uh, but nonetheless, it's there and you have to deal with it. Um, so like you could break your outputs into these like low hamming weight outputs. Uh, so uh, outputs that require only a single symbol of this like constrained set of symbols. Um, so either a pure power of two or like a, um, uh, um, like one of those one to five uh, series values. Uh, and you can fairly efficiently represent an arbitrary amount um, as uh, combinations of these. Uh, I say fairly efficiently because it's still like an overhead of, uh, you know, probably uh, at least a factor of 10 or something like that in terms of the, the number of outputs that you need. Um, but this is a straw man example, so bear with me. Um, so the first thing I do is I split my arbitrary sized coin into like these standard denomination sized coins. And then I could go and mix every one of those coins separately. So I I mix like uh, 0 0.01 in the 0 0.01 uh, coin joins and I mix like 0 0.005 in the 0 0.005 coin joins. Um, and after I've done that, I now have a bunch of different outputs that are each of them has been mixed with that uh, like equal amount coin join uh, structure um, and should arguably have uh, a good privacy. Um, I could then, if, if I maintain a sufficiently large pool of these standard denominations, I could combine them into uh, arbitrary amounts and make payments with exactly the same overhead as like breaking up a random amount. Uh, so like, Generally speaking, it's going to be like a logarithmic number of inputs uh, in the uh, amounts, uh, but but more practically, it's it's probably less because um, you need uh, um, uh, you don't need that many significant digits um, uh, with with today's prices. So um, I guess the like where all of these things kind of come together um, is you can, with Wabi Sabi, you, you no longer need to do that in separate steps. Uh, like I could break up an input um, 
as part of a coin join transaction, I could make payments as part of a coin join transaction, and I could do mixing as part of a coin join transaction, and it could all be the same transaction. Uh, like in my previous uh, proposal, I, I was suggesting to do that, but the coordinator would still know, uh, like this output was a mixing output, or uh, this input was a an input that was uh, split because it would do like these different round types with blind signatures um and effectively um uh let you um uh, make these combinations uh so with with, with um uh, sorry uh, make these combinations like uh separately and then uh the coordinator would concatenate the different like rounds that happen to coincide in time um that is no longer required, which is a um, a huge efficiency improvement over that straw man idea. Because uh, if you um, if you can do this more directly, then you don't need to create and destroy all of those intermediate outputs. Um, however, if you do this naively, it goes right back to like the shared coin model, where you just allow arbitrary actions. So um, the more recent insight is that we can uh, do a special case of this knapsack mixing where um, instead of using like, uh, instead of deriving the splitting amounts uh, from different users subtransactions, which has um, issues for privacy. So you reveal to the other participants what you would have done had they not been there uh, and also to the coordinator. Um, so, um, the like the way that I'm um, like that I, I'm I'm proposing right now, and it, just to be clear, this is not like we don't have consensus about this yet. So uh, I'm mainly speaking for myself here. Uh, I I think the others are are mainly on board, but they haven't like scrutinized this yet. So um, the idea is you can um, treat a variable amount as um like a combination of standard denominations like let's say i want to register 123 satoshis uh as an output never mind that that's like way below the dust limit but like um in the 125 representation that would be uh one satoshi uh two satoshis uh 20 satoshis and 100 um so if in this transaction there already are users mixing those standard denominations. Uh, I could add that amount, and I would have plausible deniability for exactly the same reason that the uh, like the knapsack argument works, right? That this amount arithmetically relates to those mixed amounts, and it could be made as any combination of like the the ones, the twos, the twenties, and the hundreds. Um, so the 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 simplification here is that by having those preset um like you you don't need to do the coordination dynamically and you also gain um a uh um so this was in um greg maxwell's like coin join post initially like the uh this is a bit of a digression sorry um but like when you have a coin join um it could be equivalent to like a set of coin joins. Um, so what do I mean by this? Like imagine there's uh, four parties, uh, Alice, Bob, uh, Dave, and Carol, uh, and they all want to do like a coin join. They could do a four party coin join with equal uh, amount outputs. And then uh, they would have an anonymity set of uh, like four each or anonymity set size of, of four each. Uh, but suppose that's too large to be uh, included in the blockchain. So uh, Greg pointed out in his original post that that's not really a limiting uh, factor because um, this transaction would be equivalent to a uh, like a switching network topology. Um, uh, in his example, it was a class network. Um, but uh, like for this four party case, it's simpler to think of it as a, uh, so it's a, like a Benes network is simpler. So like imagine, Alice and Bob doing a two uh, party coin join and uh, Carol and Dave doing a two party coin join. Uh, and then 
either Alice or Bob does a two party coin join with either Carol or Dave. And uh, this happens twice. So you have uh, four transactions overall in like two generations. You have um, uh, more overall block space requirements, but um, each transaction is smaller. Uh, and the total structure is uh, from a, like the privacy analysis point of view, it's, it's exactly equivalent because uh, each uh, final output could have been funded but by any of the four uh, original inputs. So um, this gives a, a sort of um, intuition for um, how you can have uh, inheritance of anonymous uh, anonymity sets uh, across like a, a transaction graph. Uh, so it's it's not just in the space of a single coin join transaction that like you you gain privacy, but um, uh, the, the the potential um, is is much larger. Uh, Samurai does this, and I think does it very well in the the whirlpool stuff. Uh, I have like some criticism of, of the transaction structure for for different reasons, but like I, it, as far as the like homogeneity of uh, outputs, like they have uh, two users fund three other users who have already mixed. Um, so like two of the inputs play, pay a slightly larger amount uh, and everybody gets the same output amount. And then once you've already mixed, you can mix for free as long as there are like users willing to subsidize your, uh, your mixing. Mm -hmm. um, and that creates, even though their transactions are quite small, so they only have five users, uh, it's not the set of users in a transaction that matters, but rather it's like the um, you're limited by um, all of the um, all of the inputs appearing in the history, all of the inputs that could have led to this uh, input. Um, so, so Wabi Sabi, like one of the key things that it brings is you can register for essentially arbitrary coordinated transactions and even multiple in one go. So I can give you one input and say, I want to do these things with it. And then those will occur. And then I'll get back, obviously, the final outputs to addresses that I control. Um, but it allows you yeah. to do multiple steps with one registration rather than saying, I want to register for a point one output coin join, I want to register for a 0 0.05. I, you can do it all at once. Everything happens via the coordinator, and then you get back your outputs at the end of that. And everyone along the way gains so, some privacy because of those interactions that you're having as well. So it still works like the current zero link in the sense that there's uh, an input registration phase. Uh, so first you, you register your intent to spend inputs. And at that point, you just request credentials that add up to the input amount. And the coordinator does not know. So like you can split it up any which way you want. Presumably, it's going to reflect what your uh, output registration uh, actions are going to be. Uh, then after the round is filled up or timed out, it switches phase to the output registration phase. And then you use the credentials to um, you present them in order to claim output amounts. So you basically uh, submit a zero knowledge proof that you have a valid credential without actually disclosing it. And you submit a randomized um, a version of the amount commitment. Uh, and um, the Mac that you have, uh, like the, the actual credential, um, uh, that you prove in zero knowledge, it uh, authenticates to the coordinator the underlying amount without revealing it. Uh, so you can present multiple credentials at the same time and basically ask the coordinator to give you the sum of this amount, uh, of these amounts as like your requested uh, output. Um, and so basically like it doesn't have to be in advance but but yeah the intuition is the same like you can you basically do whatever you want uh, but the uh coordinator can of course say well I, I i refuse to register inputs of this amount or i refuse to register outputs of that amount um because that is happening at like the like the blockchain level of abstraction. This is just like normal Bitcoin transaction data. 
uh, so the amounts are, are in clear text. Um, to get the knapsack mixing logic to kind of work, what the coordinator would do, um, I think uh, it's 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 a little bit more nuanced than that, but like what you can imagine is like the coordinator only accepting outward registrations for um, arbitrary amounts, amounts with a higher Hamming weight. Um, after all of the bits, like thinking about this in powers of two, like so, uh, only after all of the um, single bit amounts standard like powers of two have been included um and there's like a, a, at least um so a, at least multiple like inputs and multiple outputs of of every one of those amounts like if they're purely powers of two then you can you know uh, i i hope very intuitively see that like you can make uh in uh, arbitrary amount with multiple bits set in it as some combination of amounts that have already been registered. Uh, so by only allowing output registrations that um, uh, um, adhere to this constraint, um, like you force the users to first register um, uh, standard denomination outputs, and only when enough users have registered standard denomination outputs to kind of provide a, a cover for the uh, arbitrary amounts, like the the different uh, mixed amounts kind of unlock and are allowed to be used uh, in in the arbitrary amount registrations. So you could um, you could end up waiting a while if you don't want a normal denomination out of the output with your credentials, but you want some other arbitrary amount. You could end up waiting a long time until enough users are doing what's necessary yes. for the coordinator to essentially give you that. So you'd kind of be putting your money in a pool and then waiting for mm, the right no, anonymity set. Like, I mean, you still own it, but I mean, to, to actually get yeah, the output uh, back. You you never actually sign. So uh, yeah. at that point, like you, you wouldn't even be participating. You'd have to like unregister in order to not be uh, like considered uh, to be doing a denial of service attack if you really don't want to follow through. But yes, you, you absolutely need other users. Uh, this yeah. is why I said it's a little bit more nuanced than that, which is like um, uh, having this kind of like hard fast uh, policy of simply not allowing anything is maybe not ideal. Like I, I would actually expect that you'd have like different kinds of policies. and you can also enforce this on the client side. So if the coordinator announces uh, in real time which uh, denominations have been unlocked, uh, like the client can make it a sort of dynamic decision where like if it sees that there's enough, um, like e even if there's no constraints, right, you can register anything that you want, um, you could still know uh, or your software would know uh, not to register that amount because it would not have privacy under the the knapsack model. Um, so th th yeah, th there's um, it, it could go many different ways, but in the bottom line, yeah, like without having counterparties that are uh, mixing uh, similar amounts, you're not going to to be able to have uh, a good user experience. Um, this actually like brings up a uh like the mechanism design uh questions which is like uh how do you align the incentives of like power users who maybe want to like remix aggressively over long durations um and like have very good privacy uh, how do you um um like align their incentives with those of like more casual users who maybe only need strong privacy some of the time, but most of the time would like to be more opportunistic or like more conscientious of their uh, costs. Uh, and I think there's a lot um, to work with there. Um, you, you, you can, uh, um, um, yeah, you, you can do a lot to um, kind of uh, persuade uh, certain users to, um, uh, be more active, uh, very similar to like how join market, um, works. Yeah. Aligning the liquidity incentives are definitely a, another detailed topic that I'm sure is part of a part of this. 
Yeah, but I, th I think that's basically it. Like, uh, this is my current best idea. And uh, I, I think the others are like, uh, in a sort of like non committal, like cautiously optimistic agreement uh, that we're probably going to go with something like this. Um, uh, so the anonymous credentials are like the, the means and then the, the goal is creating a transaction structure um, that has some benefits of uh, equal amount coin joins in that it's, it's intuitive to understand um, why they are private. It's hard to misuse in this way, but also uh, removes all those restrictions like uh, the requirement for what's normally called like toxic change in the, the context of uh, uh, Wasabi, uh, the requirement to link your inputs together, um, the inability to like make payments out of a coin join or um, like a lot of these uh, restrictions that right now are these like massive privacy foot guns as well. Like um, I, a lot of users apparently, um, you know, they'll bring in a large amount of Bitcoin, they'll mix it. Um, and then after they're done mixing, they just recombine everything. And uh, the incentives for uh, like because of uh, the way that the denomination is variable and because of the way the coordinator gives uh, discounts in the fees, um, you actually have a fairly strong incentive right now to mix as quickly as possible, which is, again, bad for privacy. Uh, even if you don't go and consolidate everything back together to the same amount that you started with minus the fees. So um, there's just so many ways um, to like get it wrong um and a lot of it i think boils down to like having those set like the the point one denomination and um not being able to do arbitrary actions like it's a little bit counterintuitive that being able to do whatever you want in a coin join is actually uh good for privacy because of the shared coin uh uh, history, but having like mixing and arbitrary amounts coincide. Um, and especially if you're able to support like batch payments and stuff like that, um, that I'm, I'm fairly confident, um, is, is able to support, um, a, a much more robust, uh, and much more usable, uh, transaction structure where, um, users can just say like, um, I want to make this payment, please do it in a coin join, and then it just happens. Uh, or uh, I want to make this payment and it's really urgent, please spend some of my mixed coins to do it like immediately. Uh, and the more flexibility as a user you have um, to like choose, like there, there's um, um, like you, you can have, uh, you can optimize for costs, you can optimize for privacy, or you can optimize for timeliness. And there's some like interactions between these. And the more adoption there is, the better the situation for all of these, because more users means better privacy um, and uh, better privacy means you need to be, uh, you need fewer intermediate mixed outputs of standard denominations in order to gain that level of privacy. Uh, so you can, you can be more direct in your actions uh, like, for example, you could consolidate received amounts and make payments at the same time and then just withdraw the change amount as uh, mixed coins. Uh, and if other users are doing similar operations, then um, you actually don't reveal very much about um, the links between these uh, inputs and outputs. Um, and finally, and rather obviously, it's, it's more uh, uh, like you can have more timely transactions because the more users are coin joining at any given moment the better your chances of uh, achieving the other goals right yeah i think we're all on the same page with the more users you bring into the system the better it is for everyone regardless of what they really want to do right it meets all the three goals you mentioned um so uh i think uh since you've been talking for a while here i think one last question that i really want to get in um just at the moment Wasabi wallet is very different than a lot of the things you've described, right? So do you recommend that people use Wasabi wallet right now? And uh, I guess, so first, just 
you know, a short answer, do you think that people should currently use Wasabi Wallet? Uh, so there's the, I, I guess my answer would be a qualified yes. Um, I think first and foremost, users have to understand that coin joins are overt and have to be fine with the risk of being flagged. And if they're not, then no coin join wallet is for them. Um, and uh, if they are, if they're uh, willing to take that risk of being uh, censored uh, in order to like improve the state of the ecosystem, shift the overturn window, et cetera, um, then I would say, uh, yes, they should, but um, they should use it in a very conservative way and um, spend a lot of time first, like studying the transaction structure. Uh, studying like the transaction structure in Bitcoin and in Wasabi specifically, um, because like I, I think a safe way of using it is, for example, let's say you use an exchange that's uh, not uh, uh, censoring uh, coin joins, uh, or uh, suppose that you're using BISC or uh, like Lightning loop in and loop out, or you're a merchant receiving payments uh, and sending payments. So like you have no censorship risk with respect to using coin joins. Uh, then I think Wasabi is still a very good uh, wallet for um, managing your um, like your amounts overall. Uh, so for example, uh, putting things into cold storage. Uh, I would not hesitate to recommend uh, that people uh, use it for that. Um, for making payments, um, recently uh, PayJoin support was merged. Um, I I think that that's I, I'll need to think about that a bit more. But like in the it, it, uh, like how much it addresses the current limitations. But like right now, if you spend, so if you mix a bunch of coins and now you have like 0.1 outputs um that's a lot of money and if you want to buy something privately uh and it's not something very costly you now have a very large change output that is linked to that payment and the only way to currently mix it with wasabi is to link it with some other input amount um which necessarily means like you reveal information about that amount as well. Um, that's where the, like that I think is the biggest deficiency of the current approach. And um, I personally would not feel comfortable like uh, as a, an activist or uh, perhaps a, like a user of uh, dark web markets or whatever. Um, I, I would not feel safe um, doing that kind of thing, uh, even though I'm heavily invested into like learning about this stuff. Um, uh, just because it's it's so hard to like to plan and and predict what exactly will happen and like foresee the consequences. Um, so yeah, um, I guess that's my answer. Uh, I would recommend people use it but I would recommend that they spend a lot of time first, like understanding how to use it correctly. Um, and um, I would uh, only recommend it if they're willing to, um, to, to handle the risk of uh, censorship. Yeah, to stay off all the, uh, all the centralized exchanges. <laughs> like if you're trading on well, this, you know, makes sense, right? <laughs> Uh, I not necessarily like uh, if you're willing to 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 you know take one for the team sort of uh, and uh, <laughs> if you want to fill out your a ton part... of paperwork on it with Coinbase and then annoy them and yeah. you at the same time, <laughs> I I think that's a very uh, principled like if you don't need many users to do that to overwhelm that system right like if you. If people start doing this routinely and they're getting flagged and there's a ton of false positives and they waste a lot of uh, resources for the exchange, then uh, this heuristic for de-risking is no longer a cost savings measure, right? Like, um, yeah, I guess cause that's most, fundamentally. Yeah, most most like, people just send money between exchanges, though, like in crypto, like it, it, people speculate on crypto more than they buy things with it, though. <laughs> 
So yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm, just... I'm not entirely happy with that situation <laughs> myself. I know, so. I know. <laughs> It'd be great if people were actually holding their own funds, but the vast majority of time, when an exchange receives a deposit, it's from another exchange, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. So. Yeah, definitely, I agree with you that the, the whole goal and basically what we unapologetically do with Monero is like, well, you're going to take a privacy feature if you accept Monero and there's no way you can write a, you, you can't write a heuristic that says, did they use a privacy feature? Because the answer is always yes, right? And, and that's the same type of thing you want to replicate where it's a useless metric, ideally, right, is what you want to get to. Um, so I guess final question I, I want to... Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think we both hope for the same thing there. <laughs> it would be great if, if using a mixing service was really, really common and if it was not a useful risk identifier. Just using it in a previous history would uh, not be suspicious in any way or uh, attribute higher risk yep. to the exchange. Um, and so guess, a very quick note on that yeah. is uh, I, I also see a potential for uh, just using this stuff for a purely cost savings uh, like set of motivations. Like if you're, if we're able to produce a wallet that does batch transactions um, and makes those usable, and and this is why I mentioned uh, John's earlier. Like he's been uh, very helpful in developing that line of thinking, and and he's been working on similar things for like a uh, uh, cost savings, uh, like from a cost savings perspective. Um, that would provide a uh, an incentive for users to use what is effectively privacy preserving or privacy enhancing technology, uh, even if that's not their oh, there's more money to get more privacy. Uh, like you need to make that sacrifice as well, uh, and the costs are substantial. Uh, so I'm I'm really hoping that um, we can also um, like uh, remove uh, that disincentive uh, as much as possible, and and you know make it so that uh, normal users may want to use this stuff just because it's it's cheaper and more convenient. Um, yeah, we, we, I think that's the way to go. <laughs> Any way you can con people into using privacy features, or is really really the best choice you have. Get them. Show them some, something shiny, like less fees, and then then they're suddenly walking through the door. Um, okay, so I guess uh, it would be uh, good to end on the note of uh, offering you the opportunity to say something to the Monero community, or is there some advice or something specific that you think uh, we would be able to benefit from or you really have wanted to say for, for a while? Um, I, I'm personally, I think Monero is, uh, like awesome, especially like on a technical level. Uh, I, you know, as, um, from a, like a monetary perspective, um, I don't even really know what I'm doing with respect to Bitcoin, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, <laughs> it seems to be a stronger shelling point. Um, I, I like to me, my main interest in, in, like various uh, other cryptocurrencies is the, the technical stuff. Uh, and, you know, from the beginning, the, like the crypto note paper was very innovative. Um, the zero coin and zero cash papers came next. But like since then, Monero has evolved um, uh, in very, very interesting ways. So um, I'm, I'm just happy it's around. Um, I'm, I'm happy people are spending, you know, time contributing to it. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I, I just hope, uh, like, I, I wish it wasn't, you know, this, like the, the black sheep of, uh, the, the privacy coins, as far as like, uh, regulators are, uh, concerned. Um, yeah, I hope so too. Which, well, we're, we're working at it. <laughs> yeah. I saw that, uh, recent report was, uh, like commissioned. I didn't have a, a chance to look at it yet. Um, it's not out yet, so wait, no, you maybe. haven't missed anything. <laughs> oh, okay. It was like a pre-announcement okay. by some journalists, but there is ah, an actual like regulatory framework for privacy-preserving currencies in general. That I'm also curious how it will apply to Bitcoin privacy tools. So I'm definitely yeah. looking forward to read that. But it's it was not. Kind of... It's it's not specific to Monero, but mm -hmm. it doesn't 
discuss Monero. Um, yep. But yeah, well, obviously, I wish I could. I wish I came out months ago, but uh, you know, so be it. Here we are. It's not out yet. So I remember announcing for the Monero anniversary. It is actually released. <laughs> no. Um, so yeah, exactly. Um, well, nothing much. Thank you so much for being on. I think it was really, really useful to hear your plans for what to do with the Wasabi wallet, because of course this will have implications, not just for people's privacy on Bitcoin, but it will help set the approach that people take for any sort of second layer, well, second layer is perhaps a, a broad, too broad for either second layer or even just any sort of uh, privacy features that you're trying to add to any sort of system. And I, I think that all the research there is very useful and I hope that adoption follows, of course. Uh, so we, we, of course, wish nothing but the best uh, for for you and your team going forward with uh, getting this, this rolled out to have better flexibility and, and privacy offered to people who you know, may have no choice but to use Bitcoin, let's say. So uh, it's certainly something that we, we, we wish you and the team the, the, the best in. <laughs> yeah, cool. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, of course. And let, let's let's keep in touch. And then sure. Uh, I'm sure we can bounce some ideas with, you know, between the Wasabi Research and the Monero Research Lab with, uh, you know, all, all the new findings that are coming out because everyone's coming up with really cool new constructions on really a daily basis at this point. So can't, it's hard to keep up. And of course, thank you, Seth, for being my, uh, the, the person who, who was able to walk through the, the midsection of the interview here. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. Uh, hopefully everyone else that is watching got something out of this. Um, check out uh, some of the resources that we will include in the description here. Seth already compiled a list and sent it over because he's just too good. Uh, so we will uh, see someone in the next interview. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.